I'm going to set up the context for this panel today, and I'm very excited to be here because we have a very esteemed group to talk about this topic. But here's the background on it. Um, as an investor over the last 15 years in startups, these are not public companies, 15 years is a very long time in venture investing. We noticed something remarkable in the last seven years. The majority of our returns came from companies run by women. And this is agnostic to geography or sector of the economy. Average size of these companies, 26 people. Smallest is about five million sales, largest half a billion. We, we asked why was this happening? What, what is going on that we'd have this kind of outcome? And this includes pretty well every calculation, return of capital, IRR, every metric of return on investment. And we noticed um, a couple of attributes that we think hides the key to this. We went back and looked at the sales forecasts of every quarter of these private companies over almost an eight year period. And in a company that's small and, and private, very often you have investors and you want to say, here's what the next quarter looks like in sales, here's what we think we're going to achieve, and here's what we achieved. We found in the case of the companies run by men, they achieved their targets about 65% of the time. In the case where women were managing the company, they hit their targets 95% of the time. Now, however, in digging into it, we saw that women brought down their estimates of growth materially down as much as 30%. In other words, one would say they're being more realistic and they're hitting their targets more often. But why would that necessarily manifest itself in better returns? Because the men seem to be setting higher targets and reaching for the moon more often and not hitting them as often. But shouldn't that average itself out? Shouldn't that go back to the mean one way or the other? But it didn't. And, and here's why we think that happened. In a company, a private company, that is constantly hitting its goals, the culture slowly shifts. It's like being on a basketball team that's winning every season. Nobody wants to get traded. And the way we're able to measure that is the staff turnover in these companies run by women hitting their targets so consistently, there was virtually no turnover. And if you're not losing the head of sales or the head of logistics or manufacturing or whatever it is, you don't have any disruption. Less disruption maintains more consistent cash flows, and as a result, the returns were significantly higher. Now, having seen that as one metric of measure, and that's a very important one because, you know, I'm agnostic. I'm not into gender warfare. I would give money to a goat if I could get a return. <laughs> but clearly now we're starting to skew our bias because these outcomes are over a long period of time. There's also another adage before we get into the panel I want to point out. The other thing we found interesting was that in the companies run by women, and I'm not talking about managers in the companies. I'm talking about the person that decides the allocation of capital and risk, and that is the CEO. This is not about women running sales or, or women running logistics. This is the person that comes in every day and makes a series of micro decisions all day long about capital and risk. So when I invest in a company run by women, I mean run by women. Yes. That's what matters. That's a big difference. The, the, the last point is though that when we looked at time allocation, you know that old adage, if you want something done, gives it to a busy mother? It applies in business because when you only have 26 employees, you're allocating time and you're setting goals, consistently doing over and over and over again. As a result, in the portfolio today, we have pulled down our growth estimates across the entire portfolio at a, 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 almost 25%. In other words, we forced every CEO to set targets they can hit over 90% of the time. Some would argue that reduces the value of our mark to market of our portfolio. And I say I don't care because I'm looking at real returns. I'm not trying to mark to market the portfolio based on a goal that no one's going to meet. I'd rather be dealing in reality. So with that said and that background, we're going to talk to some women who've actually done this, that are very, very successful in their different genres of business from different sectors. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves because I always find it important when you're putting a panel together to let each panelist tell you what's important and the reason they're here. Sarah Mongolis, Honey Fund. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, honey Fund is a wedding gift registry where you can give parts of your honeymoon, uh, parts of someone's honeymoon as a wedding gift. My husband and I uh, invented this concept in 2006, brought it to market in 2000, same year. And um, now, 12 years later, we have a, a winning deal on Shark Tank and a multi-million dollar company. 
And the reason I tell you that is because um, I'm part of a generation of women that um, were told that we could do whatever the hell we wanted to. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I mean, to Gen X, I, I really feel like it's the first generation. Well, I'm from Northern California, OK? Disclaimer, I grew up in a bubble. But when it comes to believing in women and setting them, setting them up for success, investing in their education, investing in the infrastructure of what it means to raise women who know how to lead and make risky decisions all day long. We've done that now as a nation, and I'm an example of that. And it's, we've got our legs under us, so this is the most unicorn category of investment, if you ask me, that, that we have out there. We're low risk and we're high return. Peggy, you're running a very interesting mandate at Microsoft. Tell us about it. Right. So my name is Peggy Johnson, and I lead up business development at Microsoft. Um, I've only been there about four years. And when I arrived four years ago, I noticed we didn't have an early stage venture fund at Microsoft, of all places. They didn't have one. And so I uh, got that approved and got one going. And I started to think about some of the numbers you're talking about this morning, Kevin, that um, you know, we, we saw some Harvard Business Review examples where every dollar that you invest in a woman founder, um, the ROI is something about somewhere between 30% to 100% greater um, than a, man, a male founder. And I just, it was like a staggering statistic. And so when I started the fund, I had the liberty to start from scratch. I didn't inherit a team, I started the fund. And we wanted to use diversity as a competitive edge. And so when we hired our initial portfolio managers into the fund, we made sure that they were very diverse. So we have almost 50%, about 40 some percent of our fund managers at the fund are women. And by having them there, we found that it is attracting more female founders um, because they see women in the fund and they think my idea will resonate with this woman. And so it's had a really good virtuous cycle effect. Well, a legend here in the fashion industry. Half a billion in sales, remarkable outcome. Aileen, tell us about yourself. Uh, thanks. Um, oh. I thought the question was going to be simpler, like, why am I here? Uh, no, no, I'm going to make it as difficult as I can for you, because we'll get the best outcomes. OK, all right. Um, well, uh, I started my clothing business uh, 35 years ago. And it was based just on a really simple idea of timeless, good quality, uh, comfortable um, clothes for women and um, they were they, they were kind of a system they worked together and the idea was that getting dressed should be easy and you should keep your clothes a long time like your mom will tell that story uh, um, but um, the reason I'm actually here today is because I've been doing a lot of work around my purpose, my personal purpose, and actually I really didn't want to come, so when I got, first got the invitation, I was like, no, that's not me. You seem a little shy. I, yeah, I'm a little nervous, and, but I have been pushing myself because I feel aware that I, I've done something and I have a lot of passion around women and supporting women and sharing what I've, I, I know and what I've done, and I actually really believe that uh, women are, uh, are gonna be the force for changing the way business is done. Yes. That's not because we're better, but just because we've been left out. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to be in there equally. I wanna, I wanna start with you with a question. First of all, I, I wanna give accolades here because when I look as an investor at the clothing industry, it is the most brutal, cutthroat, difficult, challenging, hard to invest in sector, in my view, of the economy. Because it has half art, half science. When you talk about fashion, from the investor's point of view, it's very, very nasty. Because you have to be able to determine what the trends are almost a year before they occur on the street. And, and that's a remarkable talent. Even as you get older, you have to stay hip to what's coming down the road. And I really appreciate that, which makes me so nervous in investing, because very often you'll find a woman like this or a person that is really the, the house, the design house. And when you lose that person, you're screwed. <laughs> and that's been played out many, many, many times. But I want to start with, with something in your backstory that I find just fascinating. Your father, when you were a young woman, told you that he could not invest in your education because you had a brother and it was more important to put them through college. I mean, and the fact that that was an open dialogue and you loved your father and you, you did not take offense to that. It seemed okay at the time. It was just, so it was here's the, the culture, question. you know? 
Do you think that's still? I did put myself through college, though. I, and you, as a waitress, you were. Yeah, yeah. Is that still happening in America, do you think? Oh, um, I don't think so. Maybe in some places. Maybe in some places. I don't think so either. What do you think? I think it's changing, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm in an odd field for a woman. I'm an electrical engineer by training. There were all, virtually no women in my class, just a handful. And um, definitely, I was not encouraged into that field at all. I mean, I, I went off to college as a business major, and I had a job on campus delivering mail to the engineering department, and the two ladies behind the desk convinced me to change my major to engineering somehow. <laughs> they said, we don't have any women in engineering. How about being an engineer? And I'm like, well, that sounds good to me. That's how I made all my decisions back then. <laughs> I said, you get a good job if you go into engineering. So I did, and, but now young women have much more influence on that decision, and they're seeing what, a, what an, an amazing career an engineer could be. But the, I, was, I had none of that in college or in high school. Nobody had mentioned engineering to me at all. So they're now getting this signal, and I think, you know, as you said, you're part of the group that thinks they can do anything they want. I was pushed into engineering. I ended up doing music, and my dad cried. So that was like the difference, right? But it, it really is a real, it, sh it highlights the difference between, you know, that, that there, there were plenty of women who were being encouraged, and there were some that are not, and now less and less of them are not, and more and more of them are. And what does that mean as an opportunity for us as a nation, as an economy? The reason I bring this up is, it takes time in a generational shift like this, and I, I notice this myself, I teach engineering classes, Harvard, MIT, McGill, Notre Dame, Temple. And I teach them because a third of the class will become entrepreneurs. That's about the statistic. There's about 35, 38% women now, and that's a significant shift. It's a generational shift over the last 20 years. But it takes time for those people to come into the economy and make their mark. And so for all of the, neg the negative press that women get about not getting the, or being underneath a glass ceiling. I believe that this is th this, this hallmark of change in the thinking, as evidenced by our, our, our educational institutions, means that over the next 20 years, we're gonna see parity, in my view. Not only are we getting great economic outcomes, but the, the core of this, where we teach, it's shifting too. Mm -hmm. Regardless of why you went into engineering or who made you do it, you were there, you are there, you are an engineer, and you're leading a team, and you're, you're, you're very much part of creating jobs in America. It's going to take, in my view, another two cycles, another two generations, and this country will be at parity. And by that time, um, our white population will not be the largest mm -hmm. segment okay. of America. So we're, we're getting a major transition going on here. Let's get more granular, granular about how businesses are run. I talked about managing risk. Peggy, do you think there's an inherent difference, because you are managing risk, you're making decisions with a portfolio. Venture investing is the hardest investing you can do. Eight out of 10 companies go out of business in America. That hasn't changed much within 36 months. There's reasons for that that has nothing to do with gender, just how brutally competitive the markets are. Do women make better decisions in mitigating risk, do you think? Oh, it's a loaded question. Better? You, you bet um, it's loaded. I, yeah. <laughs> I think there are examples, particularly when we went through the financial meltdown, um, where I think you could point to certain decisions that were more, uh, the risk profile was much higher made from the male side of the population than the female side. I think there, are, there is something there. Statistically, I don't know what that is. I tend to see that in, like, we have about, five of our portfolio companies are headed by women. I wish the numbers were as good as yours, mostly because we're in an area that has been largely male-dominated. Enterprise tech software is largely male-dominated, but we're bringing more and more in. And there are subtle differences in the way that they make decisions, um, in their estimates. I see that so same trend. That too. I see that more same realistic, trend, right? a little bit more realistic on the sales estimates. Um, so there's something there. I, mean, I think you can have uh, men as well who have a lower you know, risk profiles, but in general, you do see something there. I mean, you deal with your business every day. You're making micro decisions all day long. You seem like a mild man, a reporter, but I don't know how you get to half a billion in sales that way. Yeah. What are you really like? Yeah. <laughs> That's my team. How do you manage your business? You come in, you look at sales, through the cycle, through the day, through the quarter, through the week. You're making decisions with people around you. 
Do you have a strong number two? Do you make individual decisions? Do you delegate? How do you run? Oh, Half wow. a billion is a real business. Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of risk every day. Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I pay attention to the, to the idea and to the creative at the center of the business and how that works. And um, I also have a leadership team. Um, it's a collaborative team. There's six people on the team. And they are thinking about the business. Uh, I, I used to be on the team, but just in the last few months, I've stepped off of that team. Now I'm just on the board. But um, for years, you were on that team. Yeah. But it's still your company when you were yeah. running that team. Right. Ultimately, the ultimate decision on risk mitigation capital allocation was you. Ended with me. Right. So did you go into a dark room and think about it when you had to make a difficult no, decision? No, no. I, I always listen to everyone. Um, I'm a collaborator. So, so you, you tried really to get consensus? This is really important. Look at, he's having a hard time even accepting that that's the way she made it. <laughs> right? So what you She's were talking saying about that you had to have consensus to go ahead? Or yes. Did you? Um, yes. Uh, not always. Not always. Sometimes I would step out and make a decision that others didn't agree with, but rarely. Very, very rarely. Okay. Most of the time, we would build consensus. Like one thing we're doing right now we call deep democracy. What does You're not that mean? Like this. Um, what's what's deep democracy? Heard of it? Um, so our leadership team, when we're trying to make a, a, a big decision, this is not like a quick time of decision. Those are made in, usually in smaller and lower. They're pushed down a little bit. Um, but um, most big decisions are made through a process of going around the room, like, okay, here's the presentation, here's the idea, here's what we want to do. Okay, who's on for it? And the leadership team does this. And if you are uh, against it, you go here. And if you go like this, you're, you're in the undecided. middle. So if you're in the middle, if you're undecided or down, you, you're asked, what is it that you need to do to get on board with us? And so uh, maybe more information is needed, more conversation, something like that. So you wouldn't go ahead with too many sideways or down thumbs? No. Because you didn't have consensus with the team. They, right. wouldn't, they wouldn't try and achieve that goal that was being right. set there. So you're trying to build energy. That's deep democracy. Do you need every thumb up? Um, ultimately, you try to get every thumb up. But did you still make decisions with one or two thumbs down? Um, not down. Never down. Did you have to persuade but them to go? But there's these. The problem is. Because this is the definition of leadership. You have to be able to make people say, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I but respect I'm you on. enough. Right. I'm going to follow you because you seem to know what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't. I don't believe in deep democracy. There is no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not in this country anymore. Huh? <laughs> there's, there's decision making, there's leadership, and, and I've learned over, over 15, 20 years now what that means. And, and I'm, I'm seeing this trait in a lot of women. You don't have to like who you work for. You have to respect them. And right. it's very, very hard to earn someone's respect. Very hard. And it, it takes time, and it's very hard to get it, and easy to lose. And great leaders learn that that is the ultimate in creating companies that succeed, is building that respect and maintaining it, even though you might get mad at one of them. I'm, I'm trying to glean out of you what really goes on in those meetings. Because <laughs> I have a lot of portfolio companies, and I sit in those meetings sometimes, and I realize that's a good leader, or that's somebody I'm about to fire, because I've been able to just see the difference over time. Mm. Mm. Sarah, you're one of my portfolio companies. Yeah. Um, it's a mystery. You're, you're a tough <laughs> nut, no question about it. How do you run your business? So I actually wish I was doing it more like Eileen, sitting here seriously, thinking about He doesn't what think she's that saying. would work. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm making him money. He doesn't have to agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great company I've made a lot of money on. I mean, if they want to be in the dark about it, it's fine with me. But no, honestly, what, what, I, really, what I really heard you say, Eileen, was that, um, that, that there is no need to have to force yourself to come to a hard decision when you have the consensus of people you trust around you. Yeah. And what yeah. if we flip the conversation a little bit? Kevin's saying leadership is about people trusting and respecting you. What if leadership could also be you trusting and respecting a collaborative team mm -hmm. that shows the diversity that we need in this nation, right? I want to get a hands here for a moment on, on an issue that I think is, is really germane to this topic we're having. Recently, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, um, by the way, was just replaced by a woman in the last few weeks. First time in the history of the exchange. I think that's a great decision. 
But one of the challenges she faces is there is a movement um, within her constituency that is asking her to put required mandates in place about women representation on corporate boards in order to get a listing Ooh, on yes. the NYSC. That's one of the big verticals she has to deal with. And a lot of people think because she's a woman, she'll acquiesce to that request. The other is more technical in nature. She's being asked to make sure that there's no dual voting class shares anymore in the exchange, which is a, a structure where tech companies issue shares like Snap, where you don't get to vote. You get to buy them, but you can't vote. <coughs> And that is also very controversial. But more controversial is the decision to set a percentage mandate for women members of a board. Do you think it is good for America? Let's get a vote here. Yeah, no, no, it's either yes or no, okay? Should, should that happen? Should we mandate our, our large uh, companies to be forced to put women in board positions? Hands up for yes. Okay, and Hands up for no, this is a bad idea. There's a lot of people not voting in here. Yeah. That's pretty even. It seems equal, uh, but there's a lot of people abstaining from vote because they don't want to show their colors on this one. <laughs> but you know, at, at, on the other side of this equation is, why don't we feel confident enough, and here's my question to yeah. you, to let women be put in positions based on merit, not gender? Yes. Let's start with you, Peggy. Oh, wow. Um, well, first of all, I raised my hand and on the second part of the question. Yeah. Right. And I'd like to explain why, because I, I'm, not, I'm in the minority up here. Um, I feel like you, if you can draw a line back to the, the business impact of what having women on boards does, what having women in management does, you know, you talked about the IRR being much higher. If you can draw that line, who wouldn't do that? I feel like we're not telling that story enough. And that's a story, right? If you're an investor, what do you want to see? You want to see high IRR. And if women do that to your companies, why wouldn't you invest in as many women-founded companies as you could if that's the result? I'd rather it be an acceptance of that rather than, well, because we're trying to meet a, a certain quota. I, I'm a little adverse to quotas. Eileen, my gravest concern about putting a mandate in place like that is that the women that make those board seats, that get those jobs, will not have the same respect of shareholders because it wasn't based on merit. Mm. It could is be thought, true? Would that be true? well, we don't know. Because You'll always be wondering if you're trying to fill that seat because you're forced to by law versus by merit. Hmm. You yeah. agree with that or, do, or don't? Well, I think there's so many great women out there that I don't think you would have any problem filling those seats with <laughs> really high <laughs> yeah. But why is it necessary to make it a law? Um, because not everyone agrees. So you should force the will Because on I them. think, okay, okay, here's what I think. I think. <laughs> now that, we're gonna find out the yes, No, I, yes, think, I think that business has been designed by men. We love you guys, but. Um, and actually, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of missing parts to the way it's done right now in that businesses are not responsible for their externalities yes. yet. So they're not responsible. You're saying if they social mission? Is that what you mean? You they're say? not responsible no. if they pollute the water. They can make as much money as possible, and in fact, they have a fiduciary responsibility. Like my kids have a trust, and I have to put the money. My lawyer manages the money, and I can't invest it in the, you know, organic farming and clean tech and the things I want to invest in. I have to invest in more reliable, more whatever. Um, kind of investments because I'm that's my fiduciary that. responsibility. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> but you're saying, but, but, but I'm you're saying, saying this is that more we about have to think bigger. I don't want to interrupt yeah. you. But we have to think bigger about what business can be in our world. Like really, we need to make money, and hey, we make money, you know. Yeah. And and, and you've proven already women make money, you know. But money isn't enough. 
you know? And so how do we look at it holistically? And so my belief is that when we run our businesses more holistically, and I don't care if you believe in deep democracy, that's okay, it could be a women's, woman's CEO, I don't care. Um, but um, if we run our businesses more holistically, if we take responsibility for our environmental um, footprint, our, you know, if we take responsibility for our supply chains and our, our people internally, our, their well-being, I know that probably sounds a little crazy. No, no. But it's whole. But I understand. That makes it less but turnover. you've made that part better. of your brand. You've made oh, that yeah. mission part well, of your brand. A lot of people don't even know that. They just buy the clothes. A lot of people <laughs> do know that. But, but that is something that is, is on trend for what's going on in many companies that want sustainability. I can't find anybody in the world that doesn't believe in sustainability. You'd have to be a moron not to believe that's a good thing. Yeah, but conscious choices every day. But those that attempt to make it part of their brand, that's mixed success because not everybody thinks that's the reason you should buy a product. In your case, do they like the clothes? I mean, that's you basically should, it. You have to like the clothes or you're not going to wear them. Right. So first, you have to be drawn into the garment. You have to make great things. But how does this tie back to making it law to force women onto board seats? Oh. Um, uh, she's well, trying because, to squeeze out of the question here, and I'm making sure I'm going to get an answer. What well, is because it? Because my, my feeling, and this is my, only my personal experience, is that women... And maybe it's because we're socialized to think differently. Like, when I was a kid, my father was right. And I, I was a girl. So my opinion didn't matter so much. So I learned to listen rather than to speak. Now, I don't know if that's common. I can't believe women. it didn't piss you off. I mean, you know, that would have made me crazy. I think it did. I think it did. But yeah. um, I just kind of acquiesced. Maybe and it motivated you to, to succeed. Maybe, maybe it gave you a great gift. Maybe. But also what happened is I turned my weakness into my strength. So listening is the way I run the business. You know, by getting more that. opinions, by working yeah. together with others. And so I think women bring more of that, you know, listening for what's happening for the sower and the supply chain, you know, I, what's I, happening for the people in the business. I think we're going to have a lot of disagreement on this topic because I think, in my view, it, we it's should a, hang out and talk it's a, more about it's a this disservice to women to, to not make it clear that it's purely on. on merit that they get these positions. And it should be that way, can because I, they have the merit. They but have I told you, yeah, they have it, Abs yeah. absolutely. And I'm not saying that, that, that they don't have the merit. That, mm. She's making a baseline assumption oh, thank you. that plenty yeah. of women have the merit, and everybody should just agree with but that. But I, I, to add on to that, I think <laughs> the, the definition of merit is different from where you sit yeah. and from where each of one of us oh, sits. Oh, yeah. right. Interesting. Okay. And, why, and why would you say that? I say that because I'll Merit's tell very you, let me just tell you. Is it not measurable? It is not. It's measured in different ways to, it, through different eyes. Yeah. I'm an electrical engineer. I was at a company for 25 years, Qualcomm before Microsoft. Um, so many times I almost dropped out because I was told over and over again, you never talk, you never speak up. I don't know why I'm talking a lot right now, but I'm actually very <laughs> introverted. And I was in this all-male environment, and basically I was at... I was on the very edge of just being washed out of that career. And, and I had an ally, one of my managers came up to me and said, you know what, tell me what's wrong here. And I said, I'm just never gonna be that thing you want me to be. I mean, on our performance reviews, it said, speaks up, assertive, aggressive, all these things I wasn't ever going to be. And he said, I'm gonna change all this. And we now have, well, from that point, that was a long time ago, but they changed the performance reviews to collaboration, good listeners, um, good teammates. Project outcome. Yeah, and you know, they well, just think of it differently. It, yeah. you, they just think of it differently. And so now there was two list of attributes, mm -hmm. and men had some of those attributes, and women had some of the so aggressive this is attributes, a great, but it was, a great at least segue we had both. To a really big topic regarding these performance reviews in large corporations. This concept that women are afraid to speak out to a room of peers that are men. Let me give you some data. Again, I, I, I love things that if they're important, you have to be able to measure them. So here, listen to this data. We'll use Shark Tank for this because it's been on for 15 years in multiple geographies, tens of thousands of pitches in multiple languages by multiple companies, by equal men and women. It turns out, this is a, 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 in a, a, an uninformed study, but it's interesting. Somebody went back and looked at the unedited, unedited tape in England, in Canada, in the United States, and Australia. And notice that in every case where a check was written to a company, the person that made the pitch was able to articulate the opportunity in 90 seconds or less. Not, this, this attribute 
wasn't random. It was there 100% of the time. And what this particular, I think it was a PhD student at U of T, um, said was perhaps communication skills in today's world, by the way, does not determine the outcome of the company. It just determined that this person got a check from an investor. Perhaps things have changed that our communication skills really matter a lot. And that if you want to lead and you want to get people to invest in you, and if you want people to follow you, and this isn't defined by a performance review, and you can't communicate, then maybe you can't perform after all. And that maybe this is something we should be teaching all students. Mm -hmm. If you go into engineering, I don't recall a class on communication skills in any college that I taught, taught at. Mm -hmm. Let's discuss that, because you brought it up, Peggy. You mm -hmm. said, I got bad reviews because I wasn't talking. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you can't talk, you're screwed. <laughs> I don't know. I was this close to being <laughs> screwed, I guess. <laughs> but um, I, I think we just have to shine a light on different attributes all mix in to build better products and better services and things. And so if you have all of one type, for instance... But is okay. it holding women back? Is that attribute holding women back in corporate America today? Not willing to project, defend, lead? I think corporate America has to realize that good listeners are a positive thing to have on the team as well. You're, you're not bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about diversity, right? What are we here for? We're, we're about diversity of thought, and we're about sharing ideas, mm -hmm. and we're about bringing an eclectic group of people together to, to really discuss the, the ideas that we're not focused on every single day of our lives. And this is a conversation about diversity of leadership styles, diversity of skills, diversity of, of what we bring to the table. Sometimes it's not the talking, it's the listening. Sometimes it's not the decision making, it's the collaborating. You know, and we're, we're really like laying that all out here. You know, like what other things? Let's not get stuck on one or two, let's list 10 of them. What's another thing that women bring to the table that, that's different, that, you know, that, that can really break us out? Yeah, I love that. And also, I would say that I do wish I would have learned some communication skills. I think it would have helped me. So I feel like it's something I still struggle with. And, yeah. and even as I try to tell the story, I still struggle with that. So I think that would be a gift to have that be a part. And at the same time, I also want to question the whole idea of you know, the pitch and the proposal to, to, for, to get investors. Because I had investors madly wanting to invest in me. But you had already shown results. But I'd already, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm talking about people before. that are okay. trying to start a okay. business. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's extremely difficult to do right. that. And yeah. there's a question, I, th I think we got to go to you, Peggy, on this. That we, we go to both Boston and, and Silicon Valley. The percentages of women getting funded is remarkably low yeah. and remains that way. Yeah. And yet in other places in America, in companies being started in Fargo or Champaign-Urbana or... Amarillo, Texas, it's almost, it seems equal. Why is that? Well, I think if you look at the coast where a lot of the VC activity and Boston. is. And Boston, okay, the other coast. <laughs> um, you, you know, where a lot of the VC activity is. I think still today, only about 8% of VCs, or sorry, there's only 8% women investors in VCs, very low number. Mm. So if you're a woman and you have an idea and you wanna go pitch, First of all, you're looking in, and it's going to be a room full of men. And I remember when I first learned about the whole pitch process, my husband was an early stage investor. And he was telling me how disappointed he was. He didn't see more women coming in the door. And then when they pitched, they didn't, they didn't do a great job. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, you know, we're all sitting there, 40 men. And there's a woman up on stage. And he goes, you know, and we ask her questions. I'm like, what's this stuff? What? It's like, well, we rapid fire, ask her questions. And I'm thinking, how would I do? I, don't, I would do terrible in that environment. I'm up on stage, there's 40 people firing questions at me. Maybe the pitch process needs to change. I think that, <laughs> that I, I get that there needs to be a process. You have to have a way to filter. And some people, I just, I'm saying, some people are gonna do better in that environment, yes. in a sort of a alpha male, more, more aggressive environment. And some people may be better just one-on-one. -on -one. And it helps if you have some women investors in the fund so that, that, that there's someone on but the if, other side who they can kind of be more comfortable if with. If you look back at the stats in venture investing, um, it's, they're almost, they're over 60 years old now. 
the first venture firms were started in the mid-50s, 54, I think, in Boston, actually. And it hasn't changed much at all. Nothing's really changed. There's still the pitch. There's still the portfolio managers of which you've hired diversity because you think that's a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. That does make sense to me. But it hasn't really changed. Yet the method by which you can get funded has been more democratized by all these online platforms. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to matter as much anymore. The pitch is really you and the crowd. Mm -hmm. And yet it goes back to being able to communicate in two or three minutes on a video of what your vision is. That is what a crowdfunding platform mm -hmm. is. So I think the constant there mm -hmm. is communicate, communication skills. You, you have to be able to communicate. Right. So, so you're saying even the even the non sort of typical VC funding methods like crowdfunding and Shark Tank as a platform, yeah. right, still kind of require someone to be able to articulate their pitch in 90 seconds. And I really appreciate your point that maybe we need some other ways too. Mm -hmm. Those are great ways and they're time tested and you know lots of people are getting invested in. But maybe we try some other ways and see what happens. Now towards uh, Aileen's or Aileen's deep democracy, I want to open it up for questions here. We've got 15 minutes left and. Undoubtedly, you've got some. So here are the ground rules. If you just yell out the question, I'll repeat it. Ask any of these women anything you'd like. No topics are barred. <laughs> we have a mic over here, and there's, OK. Hi, my name is Sally Sakin. Um, I actually have two questions. There's been no one who's addressed the impact of pregnancy um, and how that affects, in particular, women rising in corporate America and sitting on boards. Uh, the second question is in terms of VCs um, and this pitch process, why can't there be training? Um, it, it, seems, it seems like women could learn how to do that pretty well. Women are really good learners. 65% uh, of women are now on college campuses. So why can't there be some kind of training institute for that? Let's deal with the pregnancy and having children issue and how that affects yeah. careers. So for me, that was really interesting. I, I started at the top because I am an entrepreneur and I started my own company and I made myself the CEO. <laughs> now I'm a CEO. But, um, but and, and while we were building it, I had two babies. And so I had the flexibility in my life that one of the reasons I even chose entrepreneurship was so that I could have personal freedom and financial freedom and be able to focus on my family. Um, it was a big joke on me after Shark Tank because all my personal freedom went away. <laughs> Worked hard than ever to make his money back. But, uh, but my kids were old enough that I was able to do that at that point. So for, and, and now as a, as a CEO of a company with women uh, that I employ that have children, we have, you know, we have paid maternity leave at my company. We have, um, we have, you know, we work in states where you can get funding, fed, uh, state level funding. So we really try to like invest in women coming back and making it as easy as we can for them to come back into. And I mean, yes, let's have let's have babies. That's a great thing to do. But how, let's how long also is that make period? women how, be able to How long back. is that period that they get funded for? Before they come uh, at our company, at our little yeah. company yeah. where I have Kevin O'Leary breathing on my neck, we paid them about two weeks um, paid, and then on top of that, all their vacation and other forms of paid leave. But the fact that we offer anything at all, I think, is pretty awesome. <laughs> so, um, so I had three babies on the job, um, and the first I remember. The, the leave wasn't very good, um, and I came back. It isn't very good even now. It, it's better, I'll yeah. tell you, it is better. Um, I came back after just five weeks, and like not quite ready to come back, and it was very, very difficult, but I was worried about my job. We're, well, now, um, both at my old company and my new company, Microsoft, those over time, that has changed. We've extended the leave. We're now 20 weeks paid vacation. Oh, wow. Yeah, so That's it's much nice. better. Um, but I remember my very first boss, who happened to be female, which was odd in that, in that, uh, in that uh, career of engineering, she said, you have to be comfortable with your home situation or you're not going to do good at work. And I always thought that was good advice. And so I always tell women, you know, wait till you're ready to come back. And if you need to string vacation or whatever, do what you need to do. People have different points when, you know, when they're comfortable coming back. But you're not going to be your best if you're worried about everything going on at home. So that helped me in my second and third pregnancies. Really? Yeah, and my personal experience being a women-run, women-owned business is that we've always, you know, worked with women and helped each other so that they could stay home for the period of time they wanted. Usually, it was 12 weeks that we pay. Um, but um, there's a lot of collaborate collaboration. So people help and pick up the other people's work, and they know what they're doing. And 
that kind of thing. A lot of stories about all of that. So that's sort of how it works. So there's no detriment in our company for having children. I, I recall a time when a woman that was pregnant was not hired because that was her state. Yeah. Yeah. And in my companies today, that is not a factor at all because the outcomes yeah. do not are not determined by how many of the managers are raising children or not. There's no economic evidence that makes any difference at all to the good or bad outcome. Mm -hmm. So that has, is another norm that's changing. There's no we question about it. actually a cool thing happening in our company. Can I just say one sure. thing to that? We have a lot of women who have their husbands staying home with the kids. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is fantastic, and they like it, you know? Day. And I would yeah. say in some cases that's a good outcome for the company because the women are making more money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'm specifically talking about pitching a product. Uh, I'm, I'm personally gender blind, and it, but it is very possible that a sharp looking woman that makes a good presentation has an edge for her, with her femininity, not a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Comment on that. Is the playing field level? Can you actually use your femininity <laughs> to advantage? I, I love, I love do that. What is in he talking today's about? environment, I love a controversial <laughs> question like that. Okay, so and I love the I'm fact so that you women are answering it. I am so glad that he because we were talking earlier about communication, but also relationships, right? right? This is an economy where relationships are everything. And a woman is as some of us brought up, socialize to be a relationship builder, right? And we haven't really touched on how does that impact a better outcomes in women-led business, not just because of her relationship to her employees or her collaborative team, but also to the partners that she does business with and when she comes to conferences and networks and when she's able to you know, really move the needle for her company because of a dinner party where she has a glass of wine with a producer at Shark Tank and ends up on the show. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, those are real outcomes, right? right? I would just say, you know, again, because I was in such a male-dominated career for most of my life, um, the, the one time I would use it to an, as my advantage is just I would be the only one in the room. And so they would remember me. There would be a sea of guys, and they wouldn't remember them. But they'd say, oh, yeah, I remember that woman that was in the room. Whether I was sharply <laughs> dressed or not, I can't comment on that. But definitely they would remember the one woman who was in the room, and that was generally me. <laughs> and you're always well-dressed. You have to be. Yeah. <laughs> But I do have one strange experience that's standing out for me. Um, and I w when I was uh, first working with, um, get, to get a line of credit, um, what are those people called? Anyway, I don't know all these financial terms. But anyway, factory, factors, factory. Factors, right. right. And so I had a $20,000 line of credit, I remember. And um, so I, I met with the person, the, the, the person at the, uh, organization and afterwards I came back and I was told that he extended my line of credit to $100,000 and I said really wow and they said that's really unusual your numbers it doesn't make sense and they said he must have liked you <laughs> so I thought well there was one time I had an advantage <laughs> yes over here I don't want to miss the side of the room we're kind of skewed in that direction right Yell it out, I'll repeat it. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Karen. Um, I graduated from undergrad a year ago and pursued entrepreneurship post grad graduation. Um, and my focus and my life purpose is focusing on supporting women led businesses and creating graphic design for women led businesses. So I'm curious to know more about what advice you would give to a 20 something looking to you know, potentially invest uh, or to potentially pitch an idea one day. Um, what <laughs> advice do you have? Under mm -hmm. In case you didn't hear that question on the other side of the room, what advice would these women give to a young woman that wants to get into business and wants to start pitching her own business? She's 25. You all were 25 once. <laughs> what advice would you give her? I get asked this a lot because I did pitch my business on Shark Tank on national television. And um, what I tell women is that... Um, any, I don't care what you do, what, what your business is, if you're ever going on Shark Tank, if you're ever even going to pitch in front of an investor, go through the process of preparing for that because it makes you think about your business as an investor would think about it, which you would never think to do otherwise because you're focused on the passion and the mission and, and the clothes and the design and everything else, right? 
But when you start to look at your business the way an investor would look at it, it fires off so much in your mind and it makes you so creative and it starts connecting dots about making this choice versus that one because of a better business outcome, which you can then reinvest in that other thing that would grow your mission even more, right? It feeds on itself. So what, no matter what you're doing, if you're ever gonna put your company in front of an investor, go through the process of getting ready for it because it will completely change your mind. Let's do one more from over here. Hi, I'm Amy Keller. I'm a co-founder of Pure Plus. I'm replacing sugar with fruits and vegetables. And I wondered about social impact. Eileen talked a little bit about sustainability. And uh, my whole company is focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, specifically reducing carbon emissions by 80% by 2030 and re reducing our use of natural resources by 2050. So are investors looking at this? Like, how are you, as your product, focused on um, it lasting twice as long and using less resources. Um, so I just think that's an important thing to look at, and I want to know our investors looking at it. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a comment about this that's very, uh, from just the investment point of view. This, this theme is becoming more and more prominent, and, and, and it's a very good one, and most people endorse it. But when, when the mission is so powerful that it overtakes the focus on executional skills to make a profit, investor fatigue sets in. Generally, investors will fund a business for three years if they don't see progress, even though it's on mandate on mission. If they don't see progress towards a break even or positive cash flow, they tend to go elsewhere. And, and I'm cautioning my classes that I'm teaching is to understand that there are many great missions that CEOs have and many great women that run companies that have great passion for these. But if you lose sight of the ultimate DNA of a business, which is to give returns to its shareholders, you will fail. Mm -hmm. And it's a very controversial topic, but it hasn't changed in 200 years. People take risk with capital to get returns. They want to save everything, but they need to get a return. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think that's actually changing. You mean people are happy to lose think, money? I don't think they're happy to lose money, but I think that they might, they're investing in things that may not give as much profit or as you know pay out as much like because they make a difference I personally my own investment portfolio you know I invest in no, I heard tech it. organic yeah. and all those things because I feel good because I think that money is energy and I want to put my energy toward a better future and I think a lot of people investing are thinking differently about how they invest. and I think even Peter Peter Fink uh, Larry Fink Larry from BlackRock. Excuse Rock, me, right. from Black yeah, his letter. And there's yeah. this whole thing happening with yeah. ESG. Sure, and but it's, it's not it's without controversy. And, but it's got to be part of the whole, especially yeah. going forward, because millennials vote with their wallet. They're looking for sustainable companies. We have to move really the global yeah. flow of cash. You know, we have to turn it towards sustainable business. That's what's going to make the world a better place. That's what's going to make business better. Yes. And I understand that's, what you're that's saying. That's a different panel. It all has to work. <laughs> all has yeah. to work. I agree with you. It all has to work. Let's get another question in back there, right against the wall. Hi, I'm Kathy Boffman McLeod from Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And I wanted to underscore risk versus the attachment to the sustainable development goals, which is um, absolutely essential. But when you think about uh, investment from a financial institution perspective, you start with risk. And so um, women, the sustainable development goals, climate, those all pose many layers of risk, uh, particularly reputational risk. And so it's not um, about feeling great, which we can feel great about doing those things, and they are, I agree with you, the future of uh, deploying capital to the places where we need it to be to sustain our planet and ourselves but I would start with risk because that is where most of the decisions um, start in some of the big institutions, particularly ours and many others, and I'm sure in your companies too. Yeah, good point. That's a good observation. Good and, and, and risk and the mitigation of risk and the path of least resistance has been the way for 200 years in investing. Can I ask you, is your institution seeing lower risk with women-led companies? Or we're not there yet with your job, it sounds like. Well, we, 
We have a whole realm of things that we look at in ESG, and we have um, certain policies. We have something called the Environmental and Social Risk Policy Framework. We look at gender, absolutely, mm -hmm. and we look at gender in investment, but we don't currently have a policy that says the companies that we invest in need to be X or sure, Y. Sure, not a policy, but are you saying, like, if there is a woman, is that a good thing, or is that a risk? Well, and I, I, I wouldn't say um, here. I would not say that is absolutely our policy. I would say we are looking at it. Interesting, okay. Yeah. All right. That's it right here. Hello, Dr. Misha Thompson. I run an inclusive leadership initiative annually in uh, Brussels every year. Um, I wanted to know if we might be able to do the half thumb, maybe for the Rooney rule um, <laughs> for boards, um, just as one measure. And then the other question I actually really did have was about just your startup financing and then financing just over the years. So, so how did, where did you, I guess, get your initial funds from and then how has that changed over the years? I can keep, go ahead. Well, um, I, my husband and I started our company with uh, $5,000 and a Google AdWords account. <laughs> and, um, and then we were profitable um, even when we walked into Shark Tank. So um, the investment we took from Kevin helped us kind of get us to the next level, next stair step up. And now we're looking for a financial partner to go to a much higher level than we ever have. And we're, we're an interesting story because we were a lifestyle and kind of family run and now we're going after it. So we have a longer trajectory, but I think that's a very common sort of stair-stepping process. Yeah, and um, I started my business with $350. <laughs> that was a long time ago, probably equal to. Um, and um, basically, I, um, I self-funded. I didn't have any money, of course, but I had friends who um, uh, lent me money there. $1,000, $5,000, $500. I paid them 2% a month interest. So, oh, so it wasn't equity you gave them. No, I They wish no, no, it was no, now. Yes. <laughs> Someone wanted equity. But I had they some weren't willing to take equity. the risk on you. They wanted debt. How about That's basically what that says. They or maybe no, she wasn't willing to give it up. Kind I of wasn't willing to give it up. Oh, I see. I yeah, see. I wanted to buy it. Okay. Even in the early days, you know. I, I would never have made that investment. I would have made sure I had some equity. <laughs> Oh, there we go. No, we're but they were my friends, so from two percent a month interest, you know. Yeah, twenty four percent. Every time I turn usury production. Yeah, I know it sounds like that, but for me, I could double my money in three months. But you were very successful regardless. That's yeah. the point. Well, that's important part too. But I did want to say one other thing is that I never did take investment. You know, I I got loans and lines of credit and loans, and the, and I just grew. Organically, I grew more slowly than, you know, I grew as I could it, afford it to grow. It may be that one of the secrets of the success of return on investment from women is they're willing to grow more slowly. And yeah. actually, that's a good attribute in yeah. a company yeah. because you yeah. learn a lot and the mistakes you make are smaller than the ones that could put you out of business. Yeah. I'm becoming more and more attuned to that, that slow is good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sheila Brennan. I live here. Um, along those lines, do you find that there's any hesitancy for investment of women who reach their stride at a certain age, um, especially in the tech world? Um, Is that another way of saying, do people want to invest in older women? Yeah. yeah. I, I think, think that's a great category. That is a great question. What do you yeah. think? Because we have done the, a lot of the work. Yeah. And we finally, uh, many of us find that we know what we want and know our direction and have the experience and still are energetic. And you have the enough. relationships. We have relationships. Yeah. Do you find there's any hesitancy in the venture capital world to invest in us? I, I don't care about gender or age. I want returns. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. And, and so that hasn't been a problem for us. We've recently funded um, a 64-year-old woman with a heck of a good idea. And she has a great team because she worked in that area for a long time. Experience, I think Sarah, you said experience is gold. It's yeah. gold. It is. Look, make American golden again. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't noticed it. We're, our fund's only two years old, but I haven't noticed that at all. So keep going. Yeah. Come see us. Let's, do it. <laughs> Let's go over here. Started with an amazing statistic that uh, 95% of women hit their targets, 65% right. of men. Um, 
and yet there's this huge gap in women still not being invested in. So why, why is that and how would you bridge the gap and how do we let people know this amazing news? Well, well first of all, my data is coming from the risky, riskiest segment of the economy, startups. This is venture investing. And um, they're private companies, so the data is very hard to extract. And mine is real anecdotal data. It's not academic. It's my portfolio. It's been going for 15 years, actually 16 years now. And so we've been looking at it from the context of every time we put out a million dollars, we look at the past and see what the results were. My whole point about this is behavioral change in any economy, in any geography, can't be mandated. It can't be done by law. It has to be done by economic mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And why America is going to change and why women will be 50% of entrepreneurs and CEOs and managers mm -hmm. is because of merit and economic outcome. Mm -hmm. I am quietly changing my investments now. 70% are with women startups only because I have to get a return. Mm -hmm. Not because of gender, nothing to do with it. And we, we keep looking at our outcomes in terms of one metric that we care about, getting the capital back. Mm -hmm. You don't make any money, so you got your money back. Return of capital is way more important in my business than return on capital. You want it back. And because of this, this lower volatility of these women-led companies at a very difficult stage, the first zero dollars to five million in sales, they're way better at it. We get higher returns. We just, when we have two opportunities, one run by a woman, one run by a man in the same sector, we're just going based on returns, and that's it. And my point is, this is not, I'm not alone on this. No. Peggy made reference to research that's coming out of Harvard. In, in, in management of economic portfolios, in equities and debt, women are killing it as portfolio managers. I think it's market forces that are gonna change it. In other words, like let's not let's not try to force it through policy, let's make it like natural in the market, right? So like if, if traditional Silicon Valley VC isn't going to invest in women because they're all men and they can't identify and it's not an investor um, entrepreneur fit, then she's gonna go find the fit somewhere else. And you're gonna see VC shrinking and shrinking and shrinking over time as other outlets like Shark Tank and investors like Kevin and crowdfunding and other platforms run by women like Elvis are blowing up because they're winning with women, right? It's gonna correct itself. And what Kevin's saying, he thinks it's gonna be another two generations. Before yeah, I always really thought doing this panel would be about optimism. I just know it's coming. I yeah. just know it's coming. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a second. Thank you. My name is Prerak. This has been fantastic hearing you all. Uh, wanted to get your opinion on, do you think any structural changes are needed in the way companies or corporates are run to bridge some of the gap? Because issues we face today are real. There's a lot of optimism, but should the market forces correct itself, or are there policy changes? You briefly touched upon lack of maternity leave or paternity leave to some extent. So are there any other such measures? Well, I, I'm gonna, I, I think we should all speak to this question. It's very important. This is about letting the market decide or letting policy decide. And without getting into politics at all, because I just, I'm so tired of the rhetoric going on in our you know, partisan Did country here. Yeah. Here's what I think. If you look at the last 10 years versus these last 30 months, and I look at my portfolio of private companies in practically every state, we are on fire in a way that I haven't seen in over 12 years. And I believe it's because of reduction in tax rates and reduction in regulations. Hmm. Now, I don't care how we got here, and I don't, it, 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 I don't, I don't even bother listening to the crapola out there anymore. What I look at is what's happening in California, what's happening in Texas, what's happening in Florida, and it's all good. Mm -hmm. And this is great for America because we're gonna hit 3% GDP growth and maybe more. And you know what that says to me? I don't wanna hear I'm from the government, I'm here to help you anymore. I don't want any of that. What made this country great for me when I was very fortunate to start a business decades ago in Boston was the market, the capital, and people, talent. There was no government involved. In fact, there was none. And I'm, we're going back to a time now where the market forces are in play. This is not, everybody doesn't agree with this. But I've now realized that this experience 
is based on fact. I've, I've lived through a heavily regulated, heavy, hev heavily policy cycle in America, and now I'm living through one with, where it's less. Mm. And I'm telling you, this is way better. Mm. And it's going to keep getting better and better. Mm. We're going back to the 60s here. <laughs> so we can well, and I didn't mention anyone. any presidents or anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know, in terms of regulation, and I don't know, I don't think there's anything specifically, I don't know around women's, there's probably, I, I haven't thought about it, I don't know actually. But in terms of the environment, you know, to me, the whole GDP growth is, is if it's good growth, it's okay, it's good, as long as we're not polluting more, as long as we're, um, as long as we're measuring our externalities, you know, because, one and a half planets a year, you know, and if we're and if and if we have less regulation on the environment, that's not a good thing. You probably don't know. I'm a graduate of environmental studies. That oh, is good. my I'm undergraduate, sorry. so I'm for that. <laughs> yeah. But I like okay. jobs a lot. I like jobs. I like jobs in America. Peggy. Um, I think. I mean, as a corporation, we're always trying to achieve growth. Um, and we're taking a close look at how we have the most inclusive environments on our campus so that each person can be the best they can be. Mm -hmm. and, and that takes some, you know, you gotta shine a light on some things. The whole thing about the quiet ones, you know, we, we have this idea of 10 inclusive behaviors. If you've got a quiet person in a meeting, maybe ask them for their input, because sometimes yeah. it's hard for them to break in. And so as a company, we're focused on that, mm -hmm. and that produces growth. When yeah. everybody can just be themselves, yeah. they, they're yeah. gonna do Company their best policy, work. I think, is where, where you go with that, right? Yeah. Government policy is not gonna hit the ground yeah. and, and make results as fast as company policies. And companies can make those decisions um, easily. They can change things. I mean, okay, some bigger companies, it's not as easy to make a sea change of cultural th things. But you know what I'm saying? Like, we can, we can um, write into the policy, you know, how to treat p quiet people in meetings. Mm -hmm. We can write into the policy how much maternity leave we get and what kind of ways we invest in women outside of that or how we diversify our boards. So I think there's a lot that can be done at the company level. I think we've run out of time. I'm cognizant that you have other places to go, but I wanted to thank these wonderful women for this panel. I would have to say,